You're listening to The Creation Academy, a weekly podcast and radio show defending the truth of God's Word in biblical creation science. I'm your host, Steve Schramm, and this week we're going to be talking about building a better framework for biblical creationism. And you might ask, what would that mean? What would a better framework look like? Well, as we look at the history of creation science, I really think that um, it's... uh, followed a pretty linear progression, right? I mean, it's creation science, when it first got started, kind of had this trajectory that it got set on. And to be honest with you, the landscape has not changed much uh, up until now. It really, really hasn't. And so we're going to explore a little bit of the history around that and talk about the beginnings of the modern creation science movement. And then we're going to look at the future and kind of see what it takes and what it's going to take for creation science to be taken seriously. So uh, let's dive right in. You might say that the modern biblical creation movement was really started and set into motion by a man named Dr. Henry Morris. Now, this is evidenced by, if you know anything about biblical creation science at all, you know the name Dr. Henry Morris. He was foundational in coming up with the ideas that you see circulating around in the creation science movement. And to be honest with you, many of the um, models and and predictions that r- resulted from his work are still in place today. Um, they make so much sense, and we haven't really come up with anything um, that made any more sense than that, and so that's what we went with. And he was really the first to popularize this idea that creationists might not be just a bunch of uh, a Bible-thumping fundamentalist wackos, that scientifically speaking, there might actually be a case. And there are some other names around that same time. Uh, Dwayne Gish comes to mind. He partnered, of course, with Dr. Morris on many things. Um, Dr. Gary Parker, he's another one that comes to mind. But Dr. Henry Morris really is the one credited for getting the ball rolling. And he did so with a book called Scientific Creationism. And that was later updated around the 80s, I believe. And, um, and I've read that updated version. And... In this book, it kind of takes us across the gamut of scientific discoveries, and he makes some proposals in there um, about how we could possibly start to explain some things that we see around the world. And one of the things that he did, which is very paramount and widely seen in the creation science movement even today, is what I like to call evolution bashing, (laughs) okay? Um, You know, to be honest with you, there are some creation ministries, and we'll not name names, but there are some who have just about made a sport out of out of evolution bashing, and let me say, I, frankly, I do enjoy it. Uh, I enjoy watching some of these ministries. Some of them take a a lot bolder stands on on things, maybe even than I do. Um, And, you know, I admit that with a humble spirit. You you know, I mean, some of these guys just really, really know their stuff. And admittedly, I'm not a scientist. You know, I'm I'm still learning some of these things. But um, I'm pretty convinced that more and more I look into evolutionary theory. I'm not saying that it makes sense because... Uh, Certainly, as a Christian, it does not. But as a person who would expect to see the non-Christian world blinded by the things of scientific discovery, I mean, the Bible pretty clearly tells us that man's wisdom is going to get man in, in, in his own way. The Bible is very clear on that. I can certainly see how in the flesh these, uh, you know, the modern uh, scientific evolutionary explanation for things makes sense to people. And you might criticize me for that, but I'm just being honest with you. I I can really see how it makes sense to them. And I think if you look at this situation and approach it humbly, you would 
you know, probably see the same exact thing. Yes, to us, evolution seems like a terrible, terrible explanation things uh, for the for the way things are. But I don't think you can see that if you're not a Christian. At least I have yet to meet a non-Christian who agrees with recent creation. Now, there might be one out there, but I have yet to meet one. And so that tells me that the problem goes deeper than just the scientific theory being flawed. It has to do with the heart change and the mind change that come about as only can through salvation and through a renewed mind given to us by Jesus Christ. And so the creation science landscape that was kind of set in motion by guys like uh, Dr. Morris, Dr. Parker, Dr. Gish, and, and, and different folks like that um, really has lent itself to this evolution bashing kind of mentality. You know, one of the first names I can think of that comes to mind is is Kent Hovind and, of course, Ken Ham. Uh, these are two guys who um, are unashamed to to expose the flaws in evolutionary thinking and those are definitely definitely there um and i think there's a place for that so i say what i'm getting ready to say next very carefully and very humbly but i think as do many other creation scientists um think that we may need to adopt a new approach. And there are some who are working towards this. Now, of course, like I said, there is a place uh, for this evolution bashing or this exposing of the faulty thinking in evolutionary theory because it's definitely there. There are definitely some serious logical problems with evolution. Uh, Dr. Jason Lyle talks a lot about that in his ministry and his work, the Biblical Science Institute. Um, but the reality is, is that if we don't give people a better alternative then there's we're very unlikely to see much change come about. Now, I realize, just like I said before, that salvation and the renewed mind is really the key to creation science um, and to accepting it fully. But I do think there's enough really, really, really good science in the mix, even so far, to where it can be accepted and really be taken seriously. And that's what we want to work towards. And we're going to talk more um, maybe about that question in just a moment. But I do want to look at this, perhaps this idea of creationists taking a new approach, a new approach. And perhaps I'm specifically speaking to those who are called to be the purveyors of the Christian um, creation message and uh, to those who are called to to spread the message in the more popular way, in the media-centric um, way. Those who are speakers, bloggers, podcasters like myself. Those who are really trying to get the message of creation out there. Because the reality is, is that the scientists, there's a lot of really, really good creation scientists who are doing some great work uh, what you might say on the inside. And what I mean by that is a lot of times we cannot see um, popularly the work that these scientists are doing. And there's many reasons for that. Um, many reasons for that. You know, of course, number one would be there's a lack of government funding, right? I mean, you notice that most of the scientists who are doing work in these areas, and I'm talking about really good research work, are working for ministries like um, ICR, which was started by Henry Morris, and um, CMI, and of course, Answers in Genesis. And so it takes these bigger organizations um, that are able to afford to even pay these scientists to use their time to, to do research. And, you know, I'm thankful for those outlets, but I do think it's unfortunate, you know, that those are the only places that these scientists can really do their work. And uh, there is much evidence of, of creation scientists losing tenure, losing their positions, you know, in their teaching positions in universities and different things. And this is, this is rampant. This has been going on for many, many years now. And there are many challenges in the way. And for that reason, creation science has actually uh, 
been impressively successful, no more attention uh, than it has gotten. Um, and, uh, and I'm surprised about the amount of attention that it has gotten, considering there is no public funding for the research of such a thing. Uh, evolution is really the only, um, you know, scientific idea regarding uh, origins. In fact, many of them just regard it as fact. They they equivocate on the word all the time and just call it science. Uh, evolution is science. A lot of people uh, are being quoted as saying that it's just like gravity. And I think some creation scientists would vehemently disagree uh, with that statement. But the creation scientists are nevertheless getting a lot of really good work done and putting some models out there. However, most of the purveyors, most of the megaphones of the message, the guys who are supposed to be out there doing the speaking, are still focused on evolution bashing. And I get why. I, I get why, because most of the lay people, especially in the pews and churches, which is where much of this is going on, uh, are accustomed to this thinking with the creation mindset. And so the things of the evolutionary mindset do not make sense to most of them. And so it's easy to go in to a church and to evolution bash for a couple hours. And I get it. It really does strengthen the faith of some. Um, it, it helps. It can certainly help with keeping people um, in church. Um, and, and it can certainly help with seeing people get saved. And that's where I really hesitate to bash people. Ministries like CMI, ICR, um, AIG, and even Kent Hovind's ministry, CSE, Let's just be honest, most of these ministries have done a great job at leading people to the Lord. They really have. Now, whether we agree with all their methods and everything, that, that's I'm not here to get in the middle of that debate. But what I'm trying to say is that while most of these organizations currently focus on, um, even in their speaking, on, on showing the deficiencies of evolution, what I contend is that we need some people to rise up and start talking about the positive model for creation. We need to start telling people about catastrophic plate tectonics, for, um, for instance. We need to start telling people about the flaws in radiometric dating and how the Bible makes sense from that standpoint. We need to talk about the sedimentology of the flood. You know, we need to see how that makes sense and we need to explain to people, even if they don't understand. We're not necessarily going out and spreading this message so everybody fully understands what we're trying to say. They can look into it further for themselves if they would like. But what we really want to try to do is get people to realize that there are some super, super smart scientists making some serious headway, working on finding models that work and make sense from a creationist pers um, um, perspective. And I think that's important because now we're not just showing that evolution doesn't necessarily even make sense from our standpoint. We're showing that we can build models and make predictions and, and have some expectations of what we want to find and what we think we should find from the creation perspective. Just because creation itself was a miraculous event uh, does not mean, contrary to popular evolutionist uh, thinking or anti-creation thinking, it does not mean that we cannot still do science. It does not mean that we cannot make predictions and then test them. Yes, Creation Week was, uh, you know, a, a miraculous event. Of course it was. But there are definitely some scientific things that God has put in the world that uh, we can discover. We can still do the science to discover more about God. And arguably, that's going to help us to arrive at an even greater understanding of science. Because we'll now be looking for the mind of God rather than trying to see how natural processes brought things about. I am really, really excited about the future of creationism for this reason. And that's uh, the next thing I want to move on to. I want to look at this question of is the future dim or bright for recent creation, for young age creation? Is it dim or bright? And that depends on what you read. I just read an article the other week. Many of you probably saw it. And it was describing how fewer than ever Americans believe that the world was created in just six days, around 6,000 years ago. Fewer than ever. Now, the number was still 
36%, if I'm remembering that correctly, don't quote me on that, okay? I could be wrong, but I'm almost positive it was 36% who still believe that God created the heavens and the earth and did it in under six days, or did it in six days, in around 6,000 years. I think we're still at around 36% in America, and um, that's encouraging and discouraging at the same time. It's certainly better than than 0%. Uh, I think we can all agree with that, but I think we'd like that number to be higher, considering that this is something that we hold so dear to our hearts, and uh, quite frankly, it's just what the Bible says. So uh, the common sense, literal interpretation of the Bible um, definitely lends credence to this idea. And so that's why we do what we do. But is the future dim or bright? Well, here's how I'd like to answer that question. I think if we do what we just talked about, then the future is very, very bright. All right, we've got some great uh, creation scientists. I'll just name a few names. Dr. Danny Faulkner, Dr. Todd Wood, Dr. Kurt Wise, Dr. Steve Austin, Dr. Andrew Snelling, Dr. Georgia Purdom, Dr. Jeffrey Tompkins, um, Dr. Gary Bates, um, Dr. Uh, um, um, Gary Parker, of course, is another one, um, and many, 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 many others who are doing a great job at putting together awesome scientific models that can possibly help explain how God created the heaven and the earth and 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 show how that this makes sense on a young age time scale. But we've got to have people spreading the message, sharing the good news about how recent creation makes sense. And I think if we do that, well, I think whether or not we do that, the the future of creation research is is bright. But unless that research reaches the people that it needs to in order to see souls saved, in order to see more people to come to the knowledge of the truth of Jesus Christ, I think that is going to determine whether the future of recent creation is dim or bright. And it's just so important. It's so important. And so I would say that part of building this better framework for biblical creationism or or I should say maybe even the spreading of biblical creationism is to make sure that we are spreading this positive case. And I think that is really going to help us out in determining whether the future will be dim or will it be bright. And you know, I've said this before, but but I'm really excited about it. I think that uh, sometimes we get this idea, you know, a new fossil discovery comes out or the mainstream media reports on something else that scientists have found that disproves the Bible. Um, I get encouraged and a little excited when stuff like that uh, comes out. You may be able to hear that in my voice. Um, I, I get really excited when that when that comes to be. And here's why. The Bible... I was just teaching this in our junior church um, here at Northwood Baptist in North Carolina. But it's interesting. The Bible has never, ever, ever been proven to be wrong. And I wrote a little bit about this on my blog, steveschram.com. I believe the title of the article is Investigating the Undeniable Accuracy of the Bible. And it really is, um, no matter what you believe about it, undeniably accurate. It's just absolutely incredible to see um, how this uh, has played out throughout history. Um, Every new archaeological discovery proves the Bible. Um, every, you know, I mean, archaeologists actually look to the Bible when they're trying to pick up their next um, artifact, when they're trying to, 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 to dig for what they want to look for next. Uh, many times they consult the Bible first because it has such a good track record of what it says to be there actually being there. The Bible has over 2,500 prophecies around that number, around 2,500, and to date over 2,000 of them have been fulfilled exactly to the T. No other book, no other document of any sort, no other individual, nothing on earth has the kind of track record that the Bible does. It's just, that's just the truth of, of the matter. And so what I was trying to, to get to here 
is we are not recent creationists because of scientific evidence. We are recent creationists because we believe the Bible and the Bible has shown itself to be true. The Bible can be trusted as our ultimate authority and our ultimate source of truth. So as long as our creation science is pointing to that and starting with the Bible as the primary assumption concerning the timeline and concerning the events that happened, then we should be able to build models that make sense of those things. And more and more, I, I believe I see that happening. And so that's why I'm so excited about the future of creationism, because once we take the Bible, which we know to be true, we can start doing some serious testing and making some predictions and doing the science to find the mind of God. And if uh, if what we what we have discovered turns out to be wrong, well, then we know the model is wrong. That doesn't mean the Bible is wrong. We know the model, the, the model is wrong, and we need a new model. And so we work towards that. But the only way we can do that is with dedicated creation scientists who are all about standing on the Word of God, starting from Scripture, and moving on from there. Dr. Kurt Wise, and I have to love his dedication. He has been quoted as saying that if every shred of evidence pointed to a, an old earth and an old universe... He would still believe God did it in six days, around 6,000 years ago, because he gets his information from the Bible and not from science. Now, he's been uh, criticized for having said that, but at least you don't have to wonder where his um, loyalty lies. You do not have to wonder what Kurt Wise thinks is true. And you know, to this point, it's not yet been proven wrong. And so I think that's very, very exciting. So I think we have a very bright future along those lines. So um, let's look at two more things. I want to talk about um, how do we take it seriously in the marketplace of ideas, spend a few minutes on that, and then we're going to look at how the purveyors of cre the creation missions uh, can do a better job going forward. That's what we want to talk about. So uh, let's look at this. How do we take it seriously in, in the marketplace of ideas? Well, scientists... Um, and those who spread evolution, who believe in evolution, and, and don't get me wrong, I mean, evolutionary thinkers, um, there are definitely those who are committed to purveying that message as well. There are evolutionary evangelists, and, and that is a reality. That's something that we have to deal with. And uh, again, to this point, much of our time has been spent, spent evolution bashing. Um, and in order to do it in such a way that it makes sense to people, a lot of times we have to use terminology that is not uh, politically correct concerning science. Um, a really good example I can think of this is is uh, Kent Hovind's um, common saying, you know, I've never seen a dog give birth to a non-dog. And people make the comment, well... You must not understand evolution. And I'm not speaking for Kent Hovind. I don't have a clue. He may not understand evolution, but he claims that he does. And he puts it in those terms. Now, I think anybody, and of course I, I know, and, and if you don't know, that is not how evolution works. That's not how they say evolution works. They don't necessarily say that dogs would come from non-dogs. But even though they don't say that, isn't it kind of obvious that that's what they believe? If you ask them if they believe that dogs and non-dogs had common ancestors, then they would answer that question in the affirmative with a yes. And of course, there are many steps required to even get to, to there. Uh, I put a quote up on my website the other day that, you know, creationists have to explain how two dogs became millions, but evolutionists have to explain how nothing became two dogs. And that's a real problem for evolutionary theory. Um, but again, what they will uh, say, these evolutionary evangelists, I call them, will basically just say, well, you don't understand uh, science or you must not understand science because here is this evidence that I've so very uh, clearly laid it out for you. And what they haven't laid out is evidence. What they al always, 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 what they lay out is the data and we all agree on the data. We would be stupid and foolish not to agree on the data. Here's something you have to understand. If you look at the data with the fossils that have been found and plug your assumptions in about deep time that you get from geological and radiometric dating, 
and you look at the fossil record and you look at the development of tools and you see uh, the time frame on everything and you and you plug that in with what evolutionists would expect it looks like evolution if you've never seen that take my word for it and do a little bit more research i'm telling you it is not hard to see why people believe this it's not stupid and it's certainly not purely religious evolution uh, is deeply ingrained into the sciences and these dating assumptions are deeply ingrained into the sciences and when you have those assumptions as your foundation you are inevitably going to end up at this conclusion and the, the real problem for recent creationists and something that we often don't like to admit but it's true is that if you just look at things and you try to put yourself in their shoes it seriously looks credible the problem is there's another side to the story if you take away those dating assumptions and put the bible in place you end up with the same exact data the same arrangement of the fossils the same times that tools show up in the quote uh, fossil record the way that humans appear to have evolved in evolutionary stages if you look at all of those things from a biblical perspective the data make just as much sense it's all in the interpretation of things so what we need to do to be taken seriously uh, in the marketplace of these different ideas and things is to come to the table with a at least explanation of equal value so we need to be you know if we're going to debate somebody you know for the benefit of the audience or whatever we need to be able to show how our models and how our timing and how our framework can explain the data does that make sense rather than just always saying well yours can't explain the data talking to the evolutionist because many times it can many times their ideas can explain the data but that doesn't mean it's the right explanation it also doesn't mean it's the only explanation uh, a, a common place we see this is in genetics many people Dawkins and self included um, tend to to say that genetics the similarities in DNA are the concrete proof for evolution and I'm gonna state this in a very superficial way there's much more nuance to it and Todd Wood is doing a ton of work in this area. Dr. Wood, some, some great area. Uh, also, uh, Dr. Georgia Purdom is also doing some good work here. Dr. Tompkins. But understand that there is another way to interpret the data. Yes, it is very possible that if there are similarities in DNA, they have a common ancestor. But it's just as possible due to the differences and the similarities that are in the DNA that they have a common designer the similarities speak to a common designer and the differences speak to the limits that are in place in the DNA and what I mean by that is the differences speak to why rabbits can never be humans why dogs can never be non dogs so there is a way to explain the data from a biblical creation perspective and that must not be taken for granted so then wrapping up how can the purveyors of the creation message do a better job going forward well, I kind of already answered that we need to show that we have a way to explain the world and now look there are uh, many things <laughs> many areas of the sciences that still need much more work creation science is very much so in its infancy and if you're out there listening and you are interested in the sciences or you have children that are interested in the sciences I highly encourage you to start looking at this direction get a good foundation on biblical teaching do not shake do not waver do not bow and do not bend but stay in the Bible 
and and get solid on that foundation and then start contributing to the creation science community with some ideas there are i mean there's so much work to do it's astounding you know each of these basic models that we could look at in cosmology and geology and all these different areas there are a million different offshoots within each of those that all need to have creation scientists studying them. So we need more. We need more to come into the marketplace. We need more so that we can be taken more seriously. And as we have that information and as we build more data, we can see, hopefully, we will see progress. And that's what the purveyors of the creation message, people like me and those who speak on creation and teach creation, um, that's what we need to be focused on, is telling the masses that we can and we demand to be taken seriously. That is what it boils down to. And I think if we can do that, then indeed, creation science as a scientific discipline uh, is going to start to be taking more seriously. And I really believe that if we'll just stay in the Bible and be faithful to what God has commanded and called us to do, that we will be able to accomplish this for His glory. Let's say a word of prayer, and then we'll go for this week. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you. And we thank you so much for everything that you've done in our lives. We thank you for the ability to study your world. We thank you, Lord, for blessing us with these great minds and these great people who are working to build a better framework for creation science. And I just pray that you would be with them as they endeavor to do this. Lord, if there's one out there who feels that they may be called to go into this area of service, Lord, I pray that you would just touch them and uh, solidify that call in their life, Lord. Uh, Thank you, Lord, for everything that you do. Again, we love you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. I want to thank you for joining me on the podcast. And if you like it, please rate, review, uh, subscribe to it. That would be great. We want to get this message in front of as many people as we possibly can. And we want to get it to the front of iTunes, new and noteworthy. We want to get it out there for this category. Not because we should care, uh, you know, uh, uh, but I don't care about me. I don't want to be seen. This is not about me. Yeah, my name's on it, uh, but, it but this is not about me. We need to get this creation science message out there to more people. And remember, my goal on this podcast is to teach you and to make you more aware of um, some of these new models that people are coming out with. And remember, remember too that that this is how science works, okay? This is how um, uh, even evolutionary scientists do science. They have models, they build models, and many times they're wrong. And when they're wrong, they go back to the drawing board and they improve on it. This is nothing new. There are many problems that people say that that young age creationists um, have that evolutionists have too, so don't let them get away with it. Distant starlight is one of these things. Everybody, it always comes down to starlight. How do you make sense of of, of stars that are millions of miles away, uh, or millions of light years, excuse me, away? I mean, how do you make sense of that in a 6,000-year-old universe? Well, the reality is, is that you should research the horizon problem. Because those who buy in to the millions and billions of years for the age of the universe also have a light time travel problem called the horizon problem. We're going to dive into that sometime. But I want you to to investigate that and I want you to help them see that yes, we have unanswered questions, but so do you. Um, the, the biggest of which being how life just arises out of nowhere. That's obviously a stumbling block for evolutionary science. So um, don't let them walk all over you because they have a lot of work to do as well. All right. So again, I want you to help us get this message out there. Um, check out our website. You can go to the creationacademy.org and that'll take you to a special section on, on my website, stevestram.com. And, uh, and where you'll be able to access the podcast and everything from there. Subscribe on iTunes. That way you can get new episodes as they're delivered each week. That's the easiest way. Um, to keep up with things. So I would encourage you to do that. Also, um, and I'm not going to take much time on this, but there is a way you can support this show. We do have a Patreon account, a Patreon account. If you just go to patreon.com slash the creation Academy and I'll go ahead and put a link in the show notes as well. Um, we, uh, you know, this is a ministry. It's a labor of love. I'll, I'll do it for free. I really will. Uh, I don't need to make a dime from it, but the point, um, 
is that there are some things that make it a lot easier with a little bit of income coming in, especially as it relates to um, the time it takes away from my family and getting resources. Uh, and I'm not going to take a whole lot of time. You just go to the page and you can look. I've got a whole explanation of things, uh, what funds would be used for and how you can help contribute. We're asking that you consider prayerfully making a donation of $1 per episode. One dollar per episode. That's a dollar per week. Um, we're going to average that out and just do a four dollar per month deal called the Defenders Club. We urge you to join that. And I'll make a brief mention of this probably on each episode at the very end. A very brief mention, but probably about once a month, I'm going to uh, take a few minutes, just like right now, to tell you in depth about that so that new listeners can kind of understand um, where we're coming from. We don't want your money just to to sit here and, and, and build up money. We're not trying to build a ministry. We're trying to get this creation message out there no matter what it takes. Uh, we want to get out there. We want to speak in churches. Um, you know, We're going to keep continue writing. We're going to do podcasts. We're going to go through and use some books as textbooks to learn here on the Creation Academy. Some of these first episodes are, are in place to introduce us um, and introduce me and to get you familiar with me so as we go forward you can feel like you can trust me with the things that we're learning i encourage you to double check everything i'm teaching you don't believe it just because i say it okay you can look this stuff up there are some great websites out there great creation resources to uh, verify what i say and i promise you if i'm wrong on something i will admit it I i promise you i will do that and i will do my best to do my due diligence before i share anything with you um in this teaching podcast and i i will i will make sure that my sources are right i will check my my data. I will make sure that things are accurate before I communicate to you. All right. So with that, um, I certainly love you guys. Thank you for, uh, for listening and for supporting. God bless you all. And we'll see you right here next week on the Creation Academy. Thanks. Bye-bye.